and uh, worship the Lord and serve Jesus here with us as he were Christian. So, without any further ado. This evening we're going to be singing in moments like these. And in that moment, just reach out to Jesus and the Holy Spirit and ask them to come in your heart while we sing.
still singing. You may be seated. And we have a special treat tonight. We have the Shane family singers with us tonight, and they will be taking over the stage. We actually could be called the Preacher's Quartet, too. Because Alan's a good preacher, I'm kind of a bad preacher, and they've been preaching to me all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not. We won't, we won't use them. <laughs> Or if he asked us if we would sing with him. I don't know. 
It does not make any difference. We are glad to have him. And I told him when we practiced the other rocket, we have actually practiced. It's just the three of us. We don't normally practice, but when we practice. He's, he's made us practice. But I did tell him when we practiced the other day that there is always room for one more person at our mom's table. And there's always tons of food. So he's welcome to be in our family. Yes. <laughs> okay, Minnie? And speaking of which, um, as you all know, we are all related. And, and our mother is sitting back here, Minnie Shane, and our parents had us singing from, oh gosh, I don't know, we were just little and company would come and they'd say, oh, sing a song, you know, so we would sing a song. But that's our mom back there, mom, would you raise, raise your hand or something? <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you for not asking me to sing. You never ask me back to preach. I, you guys give me a chance every year to get it right. Give me a chance every year. And it just seems like you keep asking uh, again and again, and I appreciate that chance. I appreciate you giving Lance and I a chance to come share with you and uh, in the preaching. And we enjoy doing this. He's been at his church for 19 years, and uh, that his church has grown, and I appreciate sharing the pulpit with him throughout these few days. I'm also glad to introduce Luke. Lance brought his son Luke, who's uh, uh, with us. And what Lance did not say, when he was talking about the ball-playing family that we are, and that uh, somewhat proud of all of our loved ones. And by the way, I am the worst ball player in the family. He was trying to make me look good last night. But uh, I know this. When you look at me, you do not think, boy, that's an athlete. <laughs> I get that. But, but my loved ones are, and my family is, and my three kids were NCAA players, and uh, uh, I'm proud of them and all that they did. And if you want me to go on and on, I'll do that one of these days. But now I've transferred that to my grandchildren. And Lance's uh, three are my three oldest grandchildren. His two daughters are both uh, basketball players, and Luke's a basketball player, baseball player. And in his basketball games these last few days, he's gotten hit in the nose three or four times. And last night, uh, Lance, weighing on Lance last night was he'd gotten a call from some people back in Mount Vernon saying that Luke had probably broke his nose. Now, we don't know if it's broken yet or not. But uh, I don't think it is. You doing okay, buddy? Doing okay? Good stuff. But that's just a bad deal. If you agree with me, getting hit in the nose is a bad thing. Yeah. But uh, uh, I, I appreciate sports, and it's an it's a important thing in our family. But you know it's not the most important thing, right? I mean, there's so many other things. There's so much more important. And so we're glad to have a chance to preach and share uh, with you during this time. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. There's been some of you asking about Nathan, and maybe I'll be able to tell you more in private. I'm not going to belabor the point here. You know Nathan's down in Texas now. The first time we went down, Nancy and I went down to Texas last December to visit with Nathan and Chelsea and the kids where they started the church near Houston. That gave us the chance to drive through a part of Texas east of Texas. Now, I've been to Dallas, I've been to San Antonio, and I've been to the Houston area before, but I've never driven through east Texas in such a way that we came across this town, and Nancy and I both saw it at the same time. We both saw the sign, Nacogdoches. Has anybody ever seen the word Nacogdoches? If I, here, I'm going to spell it for you. N-A-C-O-G-D-O-C-H-E-S. But when you see that word on the sign, and Nancy and I had the conversation, how in the world do you say that word? <laughs> really, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look like a word. It doesn't look English, and it, it isn't. <laughs> but we both were wondering how to pronounce it. I later heard about a couple that was driving through East Texas, and they came across probably about the same sign that Nancy and I saw, <laughs> Nacogdoches, 30 miles. And they started having an argument on how to pronounce that word. <clears throat> and they argued back and forth. She said it's pronounced this way. He said, no, it's this way. And eventually, he finally just said, well, I, we know I'm right. But we won't, we won't settle until we get into town. We get in that, if we get into town, we're going to stop at some place, and we're going to ask one of the locals how you pronounce that word. So they drove in silence, both seething, believing that they were right. <coughs> he pulls into town, and he pulls into an eating establishment, and they walk in, and he sees a lady over there, and he grabs his wife, and they walk up to the lady, and he says, settle the argument for us. How do you pronounce this place? And say it slowly. <laughs> and the gal with big eyes said, Burger King. <laughs> All right. I like that story. But Nacogdoches is the way you say it. And I just, I know this much. You say it real fast, it doesn't matter. But uh, we do a lot of things where we get, that we get wrong once in a while. And I've been a part of Christianity all my life. Uh, 
been a part of the church growing up and a little country church on a western slice of Jefferson County, Illinois. And I do not regret and do not, and, and, and even though it's a denominational group that I grew up in and I, I don't necessarily preach the same things that that denomination taught, you will not make me ever regret being taught some of the things I was taught. I was taught a love for the Bible and a respect for the Bible, a respect for God's Word, and you'll never make me regret that I was taught that. Amen. I was taught a, a truth about Jesus, that He's my Savior, that Jesus died for my <coughs> sins, that in and of myself, I could not save myself. I'll never be good enough to save myself. I need a Savior. God sent His Son, the unblemished Lamb of God, to be my Savior. And, and when I was taught that truth, that He died on the cross of Calvary, he, he died and was buried and rose again on the third day, I believed that truth and I still believe that truth. And by the way, the evidence is abundant and the Bible's proof is abundant and I was taught that from a very young age through Sunday school and church from my family, from ministers and, and, and Christian friends and you'll never make me regret that I was ever taught that message nor will you make me regret the day that I surrendered to that belief system and that I confessed my faith in Christ and I walked down an aisle much like this and came up to the preacher and the preacher said, are you a sinner and need a savior? I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Do you need Jesus? I need Jesus. And I confess my faith in Jesus. Nor will you make me regret the day that that preacher, that same preacher, took me and three other teenagers, three other young men my, about my age, uh, into a church house where we had a baptistry. It was underneath the platform. And they opened up the, the platform of the uh, 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 near behind, where the pulpit was, actually. It was kind of an odd deal. I remember seeing that. And I think sometimes I walk into churches. Just make it sure. It's I'm not going to drop into a tank underneath it. But the baptistry was underneath the platform. They, they lifted the lid and they baptized all four of us. And you'll never make me regret the day that I was buried with Christ in baptism. All of that, pulling all that together and living for Jesus ever since, surrendering to ministry and being a part of the, the gospel ministry ever since, you'll never make me regret that. Now, my story, I get that. That's my testimony. Your testimony might be a little bit different. Where you learned, at the age in which you learned, the time that you surrendered, <coughs> may all be different, a little bit different. But the basics of the faith, the need for Jesus, the surrendering to Him to be your Savior, to do what the Bible says do to be saved, probably most of us have done about that same thing. And it's an exciting thing. And I know in a crowd this size, oh, there are many, maybe most, Maybe a very high percentage have already surrendered to that. But in a crowd this size, there's bound to be somebody that's been holding out, waiting until some more convenient time. Maybe some other time, some other revival, some other preacher, some other place. I don't know what you're thinking, why anybody would put it off. Personally, I would not want to go through one single day of my life without Jesus. Is anybody with me? Yes. So why would you? I need Jesus, you need Jesus, and so we have the gospel available to us. Now, where do you find out how, what the Bible says to do to be saved? Now, there are several ways that you can go about doing that, and I've had several explain it to me. I just, I, I've got a little flyer that I printed up years ago that summed up what the Bible says to do to be saved in one little folded piece of paper flyer, all the verses, all summed up, and that you hear the gospel you believe the gospel of Jesus, the death, burial, and resurrection. You confess your faith in that. You repent and you're baptized. And I, I, I pull all that together, all the verses that connect all that to salvation. It's not my plan. It's not a denominational plan. I'm a graduate of St. Louis Christian College, a real life college. It's not St. Louis Christian College's plan. It's not Johnson Bible College's plan. It's not Lincoln Christian University's plan. It's not a, a denominational plan. It's God's plan. And so I have preached that message all along. Back in the earliest days of the Restoration Movement, when Christian churches and churches of Christ were pulling together uh, in, in, a, in a fellowship with a group of churches, we had an old preacher by the name of Walter Scott that used to use the five-finger exercise. Now, I, uh, I told you just a moment ago that I probably used basically the steps hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. That's probably the way I would sum up, and I... I sometimes use the five-finger exercise. Walter Scott would have said it this way. Faith, repentance, baptism, remission of sins, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
So that's how he did this five finger exercise. But however it was explained, or another way I've heard it, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live the Christian life. So I've heard it that way as well. But however you've heard the five finger exercise, whether you ever heard the five finger, some of you are looking at me like, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But when you need, when you like me, you need a memory tool, I like it. Okay, and it helps. But I've gone through the Bible, and I've used those five steps. I've gone through the book of Acts. I believe that whatever they did in the book of Acts, however they were saved then, in Acts chapter 2, uh, in Acts chapter 8, in Acts, which is a very interesting one with uh, uh, the Ethiopian, as he was preached to by Philip, that just summarizes everything. But you go through the book of Acts, it tells us how the plan of salvation was preached, practiced. And I believe the same way they were saved in the first century is the way we're saved today. Are you with me? Now, here's one thing the Bible does. Sometimes they'll take those points, those beliefs, and will use them to make another point about the Christian life. Now, stay with me just a second. Because you've, you've heard somebody say, well, they use the Roman road to teach somebody how to become a Christian. That means they take the book of Romans and all the salvation verses in the book of Romans and try to teach a Roman road plan of salvation. And that's fine. I'm not against it because all five of those things I talked about are in the book of Romans. But when Romans shows it, stay with me, when Romans presents the hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, what they do, what Paul does with the Roman Christians, he's taking something that he knows every one of his listeners, every one of his readers have done in order to make a point about the Christian life, the changed life. And so when I take Romans chapter 6, which is the, the part where Paul <coughs> takes baptism to make a point about our no longer living for sin, that we are changed, that we have a second chance, we have a new birth, we have a new life. When Paul takes that, I want to show you, I want to show you that the, part of the blessing of being a Christian is you're no longer the same. You're changed by Jesus. I want you to have that that change from sin, that no longer living for sin, to start living for Jesus. I want to see that happen. And that's the purpose of this message. Heard about a family. The mom and the kids all went to church faithfully every Sunday. They tried to get the dad to go with them. Dad wouldn't go. Dad wouldn't go. Every Sunday they'd get up, they'd get dressed, they'd get ready to go to church. Dad wouldn't go. He'd stay back and they'd all load up in the car. And they'd come back and the, the, the typical stuff. Dad had to fix the furnace down the basement. Something happened with the furnace and he'd go down the steps and they would hear him downstairs and he'd be cussing that furnace. They would cover their ears and mom would cover their ears so they didn't hear all the cussing of dad in that furnace. One Sunday morning, they asked dad to go to church with them and lo and behold, dad said yes. Blew their minds. Dad's going to church with us. Dad went to church that morning and when they came back from church, uh, they wondered what he thought. He said, I, I like what I got today. I like what I heard. He went back to church on Sunday night, and on Sunday night, he answered the invitation and was baptized that very hour. Mom, dad, the kids all come back after church on Sunday night, and they come into the house. The furnace makes a noise downstairs. And uh, as, as dad is going down the stairs... To fix the furnace, he steps on the cap. The cap makes a terrible noise, and the kids start covering their ears. They expect Dad to start cussing again. Dad didn't start cussing. They thought, whoa, this is a real conversion. Dad, they look down the door. Dad picks up that cap, cuts that cap all the way down to the furnace, opens the door, and throws the cap in. <laughs> That's a terrible story. <laughs> and I just lost all my cat loving friends. So I know that's true. <laughs> He's a changed man. <laughs> he knew that one of the things getting in the way of him not cussing was that stinking cat. <laughs> well, I'm not saying I'm not saying you gotta throw the cat in the furnace. But what I am saying is we've got to work on being better. We've got to get some of that out of our lives that's getting in the way and keeping us from being all that we ought to be. And Romans chapter 6, famous chapter about the, book of, uh, or about the subject of baptism. And you're going to find out what Paul has to say. And I want you to notice this from Romans 6. First of all, see this. With sin, 
there's still an old problem. With sin, there's still an old problem. Verses 1 and 2. For my new King James Version, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Stop there. Here's what Paul was dealing with with the Roman Christians. Now, they all knew that at one point when they had surrendered to Jesus and they believed and they confessed and they had been baptized and they'd been redeemed, they knew that they weren't supposed to live for sin, that the grace was covering their sin, but we still sin. How many of you still sin as Christians? You don't have to raise your hands, but it'd be all of us, wouldn't it? I wish I could tell you that as I stand up here in front of you as a preacher of the gospel, as someone who's been a Christian all my life virtually, I wish I could tell you that I never fall to sin, but I do. I still struggle. This text is helping us with this. What they were doing is there were some people saying, let's go out and sin more, because if we sin more, then it takes more grace to cover my sins, and I get to enjoy more grace because I've sinned so much and grace has covered so much. Let's go out and sin so that grace may abound. Does that make any sense? <laughs> no, it doesn't make any sense. That's what Paul said. That doesn't make any sense. Don't intentionally go out and sin. I do enough sin unintentionally. I don't need to go out and intentionally find sin. I don't know why I do it. It's part of my weakness with some of the students I deal with. I teach at an alternative school. You, some of you know that I've been at Mount Vernon Alternative School for the last 9, 10 years. But they moved me, the Regional Office of Education Superintendent moved me from Mount Vernon to Centralia, Illinois to deal with a different bunch of kids to cover another classroom. Problems are all the same. So I try to pull all my same things, jokes and stuff like that. And when kids say, Mr. Bolt, have you ever done anything wrong? And I say, no. <laughs> I say, I've never done anything wrong. I've never made any mistakes. I've never told a lie. <laughs> Mr. Bolt, that's a lie. <laughs> you lie. <laughs> and one of the kids the other day, when I did that, and I, I try to sit there with a straight face as if I'm perfect. You guys have all wondered if you've ever made anybody perfect. Here I am. <laughs> one other kid said, you're not Jesus. Then. Okay, you're right. Sorry. Don't be but anyway, one kid said, you say you didn't make any mistakes? Have you ever got a speeding ticket? Okay. Well, now they've left preaching and gone to Midland. <laughs> Because I, it's been a long time, but I remember the last time I got a speeding ticket. I was preaching a revival in Indiana. At the time, I was living in Mount Vernon, Illinois. I was going along Interstate 64 to get to Indiana. And I, I was making good time. I was working for St. Louis Christian College at the time, and so I could start a revival on Sunday morning. I was going to preach on Sunday morning at a town. I don't even remember the town. At Petersburg or something. I can't remember what town over here in Indiana. But I was going along the interstate. I was going to cross in Indiana and head north to go to that town. But I'm going along, making good time. I turn on the radio. Indiana Station. That's when I realized there's an hour difference in time. I had never thought about it. It hadn't dawned on me. They were an hour ahead. I'm going along and it's about 8 a.m. But in Indiana, it's 9 a.m. Church is going to be at, I don't know, whatever time it was. And I'm going I'm thinking, oh, I'd better hurry. So I put the, the pedal to the metal. I'm driving a vehicle owned by St. Louis Christian College. And I was going, I don't even remember where I was, but I just remember when I went around that curve, there he was. He turned his lights on before I ever got to him. And I pulled over long before he ever got to me. And I tried to explain to him I'm a preacher, and I'm late, and he didn't care. <laughs> he did not care. He wrote me a ticket. And here's what I was thinking at the time. Okay, it's going to make me later and later to church. But worse than that, what if this gets in the newspaper? <laughs> and I'm thinking, maybe if it gets in the paper, you guys read newspapers? Maybe if it gets in the paper, maybe nobody will read it. Do you know that every person in southern Illinois read my name in the paper this employee, this preacher of St. Louis Christian College, got a speeding ticket. Listen, I don't have to intend to sin or try to sin. I sin enough on my own. And that may sound simple. That may just be humorous. But the idea is this. I don't need to try to sin anymore. Folks, we need to work on not sinning. We need to do the best we can. And we've been changed. How shall we who died to sin, when we died with Christ, 
live any longer in it? Why would I continue doing the things that I know is wrong? Folks, we've got to be working on it. If you're a visitor to this revival, if you're a non-believer and, and you're just looking to see what it's all about, let me remind you, those of us who are here, we're not here because we're good. We're not here because we're perfect. We're not here because of any goodness of our own. We're here because He's good. And we all stand in need of Jesus. We've got enough sin on our own. And we're working on it. There's still a sin problem. That's what's identified here in Romans 6. Number two, in Christ now, we have a new life. Verses 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We get a second chance, a new life. What this text is doing is reinforcing that death, identifying with the death of Jesus, dying with Jesus, buried in the water, dying with Jesus, to a, buried with Him, to arise to walk in the newness of life. Basically what we are before we become a Christian, we're dead men walking. But we get a chance to have a new life to, through Jesus. We are now living to do the right thing in the newness of life. Living to do the right things. Is that always easy to change? Is that always easy? Adjusting to the, a long process of life where we had lived in sin, now to live for Jesus. I'm, I'm here to identify with the fact it's not easy. How many of you have ever seen the movie Shawshank Redemption? Okay. I, I, don't, I don't even know necessarily I'm recommending it, but boy, it really does teach a lot of points. It's a very interesting movie. And if there's ever a movie to scare somebody straight, <laughs> that would be a movie to do that. I would think. I'm just, just seeing what happens in prison. But in that movie, there, there's the main character. There's uh, Red. I think he's played by Morgan Freeman. Tim Robbins plays Andy. But there's another guy in the movie that goes by the name of Brooks. And the guy Brooks has been in prison probably 50 years, most of his life. And then he gets out. Now he tries to sabotage it so he doesn't get out. Because where's what they call him, what Morgan Freeman read, called Brooks, was institutionalized. He had been in the institution for so long, he could no longer adjust to be on the outside. And when Brooks did get out, does anybody remember what happened? He could not make it. He did not make it. And he took his own life because he couldn't, he couldn't change from what he was in prison to what he needed to be on the outside. Sometimes it's hard. We go so long. <clears throat> but I'm wanting to recommend to you, don't go so long waiting. I know too many people that have put it off and put it off. That decision for Jesus, they sometimes wait too long and then they no longer make that decision. Do it now. Now, I've baptized people as old as 90 years of age. Uh, at 90 something years of age. I've baptized, I've seen people surrender finally, and I praise the Lord for it. And their salvation is just as solid and as real and as everlasting as all the rest of us. Amen. I'm not against a person surrendering at an older age. I'm just saying it's not easy. And there's also a lot of years wasted in all that time because you could have been witnessing for Jesus all the rest of that time. So the point is, we get in Christ for that new life to live for Him in order to be a good witness for Him. Number three, now we have a different person in charge. We have a new master, verses 5 through 7. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. What we do when we, put, when we take on this new master, when we take on Jesus, when we've died with Christ to put on Christ, we are grafted into him. John chapter 15 has Jesus talking about being grafted into the vine, being grafted into Jesus. One of the things that makes us stronger is being grafted into Jesus. Now how in the world do we do that? That's a wonderful illustration and a couple of good verses here. But how can we get grafted into Jesus? And I have been thankful all my life 
That the church is the body of Christ and I can get grafted into Jesus by being a part of the church. I wouldn't be standing here still today a believer in Jesus if it wasn't for the church. There's a lot of critics of the church. The world has always criticized the church and we're going to see more criticism of the church as our days go forward. But I'm glad I've been a part of the church. I praise God for the church. I love the church because the church is the body of Christ. Don't you say anything negative about the church because I love the church. Don't you say anything bad about the church. Don't you try to hurt the church because the church is Jesus. Do you remember what Saul of Tarsus did? Whenever he, before, before he became the Apostle Paul, before he started preaching the gospel, you know what Saul of Tarsus did? He did everything he could to hinder the church. And when he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, when he was blinded by that light, do you remember the words that he heard? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? What's that saying? I think Paul's response could have been, whoa, just a minute, Lord, I'm not trying to hurt you. I, I'm trying to stop this, this, this other group that's coming in and going to hinder our Judaism, and, and uh, I'm trying to stop this Christianity. I'm trying to stop the church. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? In other words, when you hurt the church, you hurt Jesus. When you say something bad about the church, you're saying something bad about Jesus. When you separate yourself from the church, you're separating yourself from Jesus. Because we're not only the bride of Christ, a building of Christ, but we are the body of Christ. We are, we are as the church, what Jesus would be if he were here. So don't do anything to hurt the church or damage the church or ruin the reputation of the church. Don't say anything bad. I always hate it when I hear somebody ridicule and damage what we're trying to do in the church. Because I know where I would be if it wasn't for it. <coughs> By the way, I'd say the same thing not only about my church in Nashville, Illinois, where I've been preaching the last 14 years. But I say the same thing when I think of Kingsburg. Because you guys have been a blessing to me and my family. You have prayed for me. You prayed for my wife when she was dealing with cancer. You have prayed for my kids when they were dealing with their stuff in life and injuries. Uh, thank you for that. And I know you can identify because I know you guys have been hurt. You've gone through stuff. When I was driving here, uh, we were riding here the first night, I got to thinking about some of the things. Some of the things that you guys have dealt with. Lost loved ones. So, how many revivals have I held here, Alan? I think seven. Seven? I think it's 107. But anyway, <laughs> we come here again. Yeah, <laughs> Seems like a bunch. But I can tell you that there's some missing faces, some husbands, wives, sons, daughters, loved ones, leaders. <coughs> People that used to sit in these pews that are no longer here. And I'm really glad to see the house nearly full tonight. Because there's a lot of folks here that are part of this church family. That are a blessing to one another. Encouraging one another. Holding one another up. Making the church strong. By, the, by you joining together in faith. Joining together in prayer. Joining together in encouragement for one another. You are being the church. You are being what Jesus would be if he were here. And don't ever underestimate the good that's done when you do simple ministry. Sometimes the most important thing that goes on in a given week, ministry-wise, isn't always what's done on the platform, isn't always what's done in the classroom, isn't always what's done up front. But it could be behind the scenes, it could be that letter that was written, that phone call that was made, that word of encouragement that was shared, that little class that was taught. Don't ever underestimate what you do for Jesus. Be willing to step out and stand up and acknowledge that you, try, you, you needed Him. Other people need Him. Share that message. Our future, we have a new purpose because of what Jesus did for us. Verse 8. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has domination over, dominion over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. He's saying, you've got a different purpose. You've got a new purpose. Make decisions in your life based on that new purpose through Jesus. 
So the kids at school ask me, because so many of them, okay, when I talk about an alternative school, I talk about kids at, at our alternative school who have been kicked out of the public school system, maybe because of some of their activities, some of their behavior, some of their truancy, some of their drug activities, criminal acti activity, whatever. There's a lot of different reasons why they end up with it. But every once in a while, some kid will say, Mr. Bolt, do you... And they'll throw something in. Let's say, do drugs, drink, whatever. And I'll say, no, I don't. I don't need that. Oh, Mr. Bolt, tell the truth. You inhale, don't you? <laughs> no, no. Never have. Never will. Don't need it. How do you do that? I said, I decided a long time ago, I don't need that stuff. It's not that it wasn't offered, not that there wasn't opportunities. I, I lived in the world enough to see all that was going on. By the way, I lived in the world enough to know when I saw what happened to lives that was affected, that was influenced by drugs or alcohol or illegal activities and immoral activities, I made decisions early on in my life, I'm not going to do that. I don't need that. And I believe it's probably best, if you're a teenager in this room, I would recommend to you, make a decision in advance, long before the temptation is put before you. Long before that peer comes up to you and says, why don't you do this? Oh, don't you want to be grown? So, so sick and tired of hearing kids say, I'm grown. <laughs> when they, they're not even 20 yet. But they think they're grown because they do this stuff. That doesn't make you grown. I know a lot of people who started to do those things when they were teenagers to prove they were grown, to find out later when they became adults they had to quit that stuff to really prove they were grown. But what I'm recommending to you is, with a new purpose, a new life, make a decision to do the right things. Because we do enough wrong things. Just our own. Aren't you glad that we serve a risen Savior who makes our life all new? Don't you just love that old song, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living no matter what men may say. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me. We walk life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. You ask me how I know He lives? He lives where? In my heart. And I'm glad that I have I have that salvation that I get the benefit from and I get to live for as a changed individual as I try my best to live for him. I'm going to close with this story. Max Lucado tells this story. I'll tell the story and then I'll tell another one and close again. But Max Lucado, Max Lucado tells the story of a day when a boy was out shooting rocks with a slingshot. Any of you guys remember shooting slingshots when you were younger? I don't think they have slingshot. That, that wouldn't interest kids. They, everything's electronic these days. But we made our own slingshots when I was a kid. I remember doing that. But this kid was out shooting rocks with a slingshot. He could never hit his target. One day he was at his grandma's house. He and his sister were kind of being raised by his grandma, but at his grandma's house he saw a duck walking across the lot. And so he pulled back, put a stone in that slingshot, and he pulled back. He never ever hit his target. He pulled back and he hit and killed that duck. Now what? Are you? He grabbed that duck, went to the wood pile, and hid that duck underneath the wood pile. And as soon as he put all the wood on top of that dead duck, he turned around and there was his sister. Oh. Nothing was said. They were called into the house by Grandma. It was supper time. They went into the house and they got done with supper. Grandma said to the, to the girl, it's your turn to wash the dishes. And the girl said, no, Johnny wants to wash the dishes. <laughs> and then he leans over to Johnny and whispers in his ear, remember the duck. The next day it came that girl's time to wash the dishes again. No, Johnny says he wants to do all the dishwashing the dishes for me. And for the next several days, Johnny washes all the dishes, does all of his sister's chores, when one day he has had enough, and he realizes, I'm just going to have to fess up. So he goes to Grandma, and he says this, Grandma, I'm sorry, but do you remember your, your duck that's missing? She said, yes. He said, I killed that duck with my slingshot, and I'm sorry. And Grandma says, I knew that. I was watching out the window. 
I saw you hide the duck in the wood pile. I was just wondering, I was just wondering when you would accept the forgiveness that I was already giving you and enjoy all the benefits of forgiveness and grace already. Here's what I'm recommending to you. Jesus offers us grace and forgiveness. What happens with that, what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary to redeem us is available for each one of us. There's no reason why anybody should walk out of this church building today outside of Jesus. I don't know all your hearts. You all look saved to me. But you know this. You can fool me. But you cannot fool God. So you need to get it right. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Father, I thank you for the chance we've had tonight to examine a simple, beautiful portion of Scripture that reminds us some of the good that happens when we uh, settle it all with Jesus. I'm grateful for the salvation I enjoy, and I wish it for everybody else in this place. So as we use this decision time, as we sing a, an invitation song, my hope and prayer is your, your spirit will work in this place and will work especially on the hearts of those who are outside of Christ who have never said yes to him yet. I pray that this will be the day. So use this time in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. We're going to use our song of invitation. Alan's going to be up here to receive you. If anybody needs to step forward for Christ, I encourage you to do that. He'll be here to receive you. Maybe you're already a believer and you need to you need a church home. This is a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching, Bible-practicing church. Uh, they need you. You need them. Maybe you need to identify with this church family. But whatever your decision, I encourage you to make it as we stand to say our song of invitation.
Thank you. I appreciate that so much. Thank you, Les, for the wonderful message. And I appreciate you reminding us that we can have a new life in Jesus. we got a, another service tomorrow night. I encourage all of you to come back. Please invite everybody you can think of to come and be a part of that. And uh, just allow the Lord to continue to work in our lives and, uh, and speak to us through the preaching. Lance is going to preach tomorrow night. And so we're looking forward to that. And anyway, excellent last night. And thank you, Les, for the excellent uh, message tonight. Let's step uh, out for a word of prayer. Thank you, God, for Jesus. Above everything in all the world, in all the universe, we thank you above it all for your precious Son, Jesus. With him, we have everything. Without him, we have nothing. I pray for all that are here tonight that are saved, that are children of God. Father, we do struggle with sin, as Les said in this sermon. It's a problem. It's an issue until we reach glory. We pray for the strength to overcome it in our daily lives and to witness for Jesus before the world, to connect with others and, and lead them to faith and salvation in Christ. For those here tonight that aren't saved, Father, continue to pour your love into their hearts, into their minds, into their, their inner being, and help them to see how much you love them and how much they need Jesus. Bring them soon to faith and salvation. Keep us safe traveling, Lord, as we go to our respective homes. Bring us back together tomorrow night. Keep us safe through the day that, that is to come. Bring us back together tomorrow night to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.